to be found in the Word of God this morning to the 107th Psalm. <laughs> the 107th Psalm, I thought <laughs> perhaps it, I was not acquainted with your, your lesson for the morning. I neglected to get a book or whatever you have, and so I'll just give you a Bible reading and a Bible study that's all right of the 107th Psalm. I take it that you have your Bible, do you? Uh, always, I've, I've ministered a great deal in other years in the North, and I always, oh, when I'm back south, when the people do not have their Bibles, we don't have much use for them down our way. We've already graduated from them. But typical of the people in the North whom I've come to love very much is the fact that you do bring the sword along with you. By the way, they told me last evening there's one Democrat here. Where is he? I'd love to get acquainted with him. <laughs> I hope I'll be a great help to you Republicans. I feel sorry for you and uh, want to do you good. Such a joy to be here. And uh, my wife is along, and we've had the time of our lives. Would you follow me in this uh, morning Sunday school study? as we browse about a little bit in the 107th Psalm. Before I read it, I preface the reading of it by stating that there in the Old Testament, in Psalms 107, we have a delightful and very accurate description of how Almighty God brings sinners into a saving relationship with himself. Every scripture we've been taught is by focal, whatever that big word means. It means that it looks in two directions at the same time. And for those of you who are Bible students, you'll immediately understand that the first meaning of the 107th Psalm has to do with how God deals or dealt with his elect, the covenant people, the nation of Israel, in bringing them back from captivity. But since Scripture cannot be pinned up very well, we have also here, without doing any violence to the, to the Word of God, we have a blessed description of the work of God in the saving, making whole, bringing in the right relationship to himself of lost men and women. In verse 1, we have a plain statement of the ministry or the work of God as Father. And in verse 2, we have the ministry and work of God as Son. And in verse 3, we have a description of the ministry or work of God as the Holy Spirit. And nobody, of course, can explain our God. The scriptures and experience make us know that God is Father, that God is Son, and God is Holy Ghost. They were having a Bible conference in England yesterday on the subject of the Trinity. You understand there is no doctrine worked out in the Bible about God is three or God is one, and yet if you know him, you know him as your Father, you know him as your Redeemer, you know him as your Sanctifier of the Holy Ghost. You know that God brought you to himself because he intended to, because he set out to, and because he was in Christ on the cross reconciling you, and because by the finger of God, the Holy Ghost, he gathered you, he sought you out, he overcame you, he broke you, he brought you to himself. And they were having a very learned discussion by learned preachers in England on the, the Trinity. They were trying to make, they, they, to explain the un, unexplainable. 
and to make plain that which cannot be plain. Do you hear me in the back as I'm speaking now? Somebody in the back, do you hear me all right? Thank you. And the learned preacher was discoursing on the fact that God was one, and yet he was three. Three and one, and one and three. That's just as clear as mud, unless you've experienced God. And uh, they had in that congregation uh, a sort of a, they called him a, a half wit. He wasn't quite all there. Uh, I just must tell this. So we were out yesterday with a fellow that suffers that way. He ran out of gas in that snowstorm. And, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, this, uh, this fellow was named Silly Billy, Silly Billy, and uh, they noticed that Silly Billy was not being reverent during the discussion. He was scribbling on a piece of paper, and in those days they uh, were a little more conscious of being in the house of God than they are now. And finally, the warden, I guess we call one of the deacons and some official, one of the wardens during the message went and tapped Silly Billy on the shoulder and reprimanded him for, for not paying attention to the preacher and took the pencil and uh, the piece of paper away from him, took it up like used to when I was a boy in school to the teacher. Uh, writing notes doing books, as we call it in our day. And uh, this type that the, the, the speaker looked at it just a moment, didn't pay much attention to it, and continued to learn his discourse, and finally looked at it again and read it. And then he took it up and uh, put his message for a little bit and said, I want to write to read you what the Silly Billy has written. He wasn't being irreverent. And he read the, what Silly Billy had to uh, tried to transcribe and translate just what he's been hearing from the distant preacher about God, or three and yet one, one yet three. And the half wit had written down three and one, and one and three. This is too much for silly Billy, but this can silly Billy see that one of them has died for me. That's good theology. That's good theology. One of them has died for me. So we have here the work of the, of the Trinitarian God, the Godhead. God is Father. God is Son. And God is Holy Spirit. The first verse, the work of the Father. The second verse, the work of the Son. The third verse, the work of the Spirit. And then the remainder of the chapter is a description or an explanation of the work of the Holy Spirit in bringing men into what we call salvation. I thought perhaps since didn't know what else to talk about, I talk about this this morning. And with your Bibles before you, let's read along with that outline before you and see if the Lord might be blessed to reveal himself afresh to us. In the first verse, I have before me a, an authorized version, a King James version. I would just almost imagine that most of you do, perhaps all of you do, you have the authorized version. I'd like to take your pencil, or your pen, I hope you use your Bible, and do a little marking out. For in the first verse, there is one word here that you notice in italics, you youngsters who are sitting here on the front, thanks to the forehead, know that the reason this word endureth is in italics is because it does not appear in the original, the oldest manuscript to have the word of God. The translators of the King James Version thought that it would add to, uh, simplify, explain what the Spirit was saying in this verse if they would put the word endureth in that. But as a matter of fact, the, the word endures robs the verse of its blessed truth. And so I've gone to that link to ask you to rub out that word that's put in there 
in italics, thus emphasizing that it does not occur in the original. We'll read it without that word. Oh, give thanks unto Jehovah the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy forever. His mercy forever. People are enjoined to give thanks unto Almighty God for his goodness, for his forever, that's not good English, it's good grammar, for his forever, his eternal mercy. The thoughts of how long it lasts robs it of the true truth that God the Father is a redeeming God and that God's eternal purpose is the heart of the Bible and is the heart of the gospel, and that God determined, God has determined, God fixed it, God marked out beforehand that out of the wreck and ruin of the sin of Adam and us in the garden, he's going to have for himself a family, for his son, a body, and for the Holy Spirit, a house in which to live. Now, down south, we're a little bit slacker in our language. I trust I wouldn't uh, offend you if I brought in a little southern. You know, you people talk funny. I, I don't know whether you understand me talking good English and all that, but I, I, I enjoy it. And uh, the down south, we have an expression, come hell to high water, God's going to have a family. He's determined to do that. Praise the Lord. And he's going to have a body that serves, which is his body for his son. He's working on it now. He's building it. He's completing it. Bless the Lord. And he's going to have a house which the Holy Spirit, the temple, the sanctuary, corporately it's the church, which is Christ's body, individually it's the the body, this body you see there, is the sanctuary, isn't that wonderful, of God, the Holy Spirit. Now, if I didn't breathe this, I'd quit preaching a long time ago. I've been a hitchhiker of Angus a long time. And I tell you a fact, I, I just nearly wasn't in a dignified Yankee Baptist church. I'd shout a little bit, sure as the world, I am so tickled that I'd go up and down the land and and just just announce in this pessimistic day that I'm preaching the message of the God who is determined by the use of all the means that he sees fit to have for himself a family of men and women who, when he gets through with them, will be exactly like the son of his love. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is for us, amen. For we give thanks for for his mercy forever. Now, I do not know any great truth that can be experienced by an eternity bound soul that I can explain. I do not try to explain. I just rejoice that I am the object of God's affection, that I am His magnificent obsession that God set over heels in love with me, that I'm the apple of his eye. Hey, that don't make me mad. I just, that's good. <laughs> that's good. The woman came up to me one day and asked me, said, Brother Barnes, I don't understand that election business. I said, I don't either. She said, I don't know what I'd that about. And I said, Sister, are you saved? Do you know the Lord? He said, I sure do. I said, Who saved you? 
He said, the Lord saved me. I said, did he do it on purpose or was it an accident? But she said, praise God, he did it on purpose. I said, that's the lady. Uh, praise the Lord. Well, I'm not good preaching on that. I like that. I like that. Oh, my soul. How long in these days, this is the most pessimistic day the world ever knew. Everybody's got the blues. Except God's people. What a message we have for this hour. A long to preach about a God who's working according to schedule, according to his plan, according to his purpose, and that he will not fail. Hallelujah. Well, let's look at the second verse. God is Son, is Redeemer. It's more than the purpose of God to keep a man out of hell and to bring forth a peculiar people zealous unto good works for the glory of Christ. And the second verse here tells us about the work and person of the Lord God, Jesus Christ. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Does that sink in on you? Let the redeemed of the Lord. He is the redeemer. He hath redeemed us by his blood. In whom we have redemption. He is the redeemer. I ask people about the state of their soul and immediately begin to tell me something they've done. But I didn't ask them what they've done or ask them. If they got united to the one who really does something, let the redeemed of the Lord. We were talking last evening about all the controversy of doctrine and things. You know, our present company accepted most people are awful dumb. When we fell in the fall, something happened to this northern of ours. We haven't got much sense, you know that? That's the truth. We just well faced. But thank God every child of God agrees perfectly on every point of doctrine when we're on our faces talking to God. That's right. That's right. That's right. Nobody better than himself when he got his eyes closed to this world communing with him. And I've heard people that fight me on my doctrinal position or the blue in the face and say I'm a false prophet and this, that, and the other, and get down on the knees and they pray and just the sound doctrine of the soul oh, oh God, have mercy on us, Lord. Come and do something for us, Lord. There's my boy. You won't listen to me. You won't listen to preaching. You're headed for hell, oh Lord. Stop it. Arrest him. Pour out the spirit upon him. Amen. We ought to quit fussing about some things we believe in our heads, because we haven't got sense enough to be right much of it. But in our hearts, experience when we're on our knees, and that's where we're at our best. Isn't that right? Talking to God. We give Jesus Christ the glory. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Just let them, just let them, don't have to force them, don't have to make them, just get out of the way and let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Now, if Alfred Hyde has been a fellow who decided to accept Jesus to witness, but can't keep a fellow who's been redeemed by the Lord, he's just going to get out on him and he's going to witness. That's the difference, isn't it? So just get out of the way and let the redeemed of the Lord pay for who he has redeemed out of the hands, from the hands of the enemy. You know, there are just three enemies of God and three enemies of man. And the Lord Jesus Christ is taking care of every enemy of the soul. The Bible mentions three, S-I-N, sin, S-H-E-A-N, Satan, and the E A T H death. And the Lord Jesus Christ has done something about sin, 
He's done something about Satan, and he's done something about death that will loose every sinner out of hell that can be brought to faith in him. So the Ted cannot lord it over the believer, praise God. Huh? Then going to put out of business when Jesus comes back, but why do we wait for him to come back? Thank God, sin has already been dealt a death blow. And the book of Romans chapter 6 says that sin shall not lord it over you anymore. The child of God need not be mastered or under dominion of sin anymore. If we could have a race of people who were lord over and not victims of S.I. in sin, that's what Christianity is all about. This would be a nice world, wouldn't it? Just know up here in Pennsylvania would be a good place to have heaven, these hills and fertile plains, and all this beautiful snow. But just get rid of sin, where the Lord's already dealt with the death blow. He's already fixed it, so sin cannot lord it over the person who's drawn to him. And then there's another enemy, Satan. And the works of Satan have already been destroyed by the Lord, destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ rendered inoperable so they haven't been a power and the Lord's already done something to Satan that enables the Holy Spirit to say draw nigh unto God and he'll draw nigh unto you resist the devil and he'll do what? He'll suck your tail and run praise God isn't that wonderful? all I got to do is to and the devil will see that that's right that's right. He can't force me around. I'm bigger than he is. If I'm drawn to Christ, I can just resist it. And what will he do? He will flee from me. Amen. And then the Lord's already done something about this. And one day, the scriptures say the Lord must reign until the last enemy that be destroyed. And the last enemy to be destroyed is he or he is there. He's going to do away with it when he comes. But already he's taken the sting out of it, like now the boy down south would check yellow jackets and pull the stinger out, get the stinger out, yellow jacket, say to her, and death cannot hurt the child of God, because the sting of death is as I am sin, and he removed that and blessed it in the grave. My, that all God got to do to make this present earth sufficient for the new Jerusalem to the house in. If the final appeal of sin and the final appeal of Satan and the final of death out of business we got heaven on earth, but already the child of God united to Christ got a lot of heaven on his way to heaven because sin cannot lord it over him through Christ. Satan cannot rule him. He'll flee from him through the blood of Christ. And death does not offer a fear now. He delivered us through all our lifetimes in fear and bondage to death. But death now is no longer that mortal enemy. Now, that's the work of the rebuke. In order to save you a sinner, the Lord got to do something about fear for that sinner. In order to save a sinner, to redeem a sinner, he got to do something about the power of faith for reference to that sinner. And in order for our salvation to be rich and full and free and eternal, he's got to do something about death. And he's done something about those three things. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of his enemies. Praise God. We've got a sufficient full redeemer. Then verse 3 is the work of the Holy Ghost. The word gathered is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Here are these people, the object of God's eternal love and affection. Here are these people, the apple of God's eye, and he's determined to incorporate in this family the body of Christ in the tabernacle of the Holy Ghost. And the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his perfect life and sacrificial substitutionary death, has failed to blame the sin and Satan and death. If those things can be stricken from the sinner, he'll be a whole man. He'll be on his way to glory. Now the Holy Spirit's got to find those people. And so we have the expression and gathered them. I love that word. Where two or three are gathered, the Holy Spirit brings them together. It's the Holy Spirit word. 
and gathered the rebellious ones from north, from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south, and he found it. He's gathering, he's lifting, he's bringing to himself those in God's love with an eternal love for whom Christ died. He's out here looking for them. Amen. He brings them to himself. Then the rest of the chapter says three things. And for the time remaining, let us look at those right quick. The first, we have four different times repeated in the chapter from a different direction because God cannot be hemmed up into one, just one little way of doing things. And because as there are no two stars alike, no two individuals, and God never deals exactly the same way with any two individuals in bringing them to himself. But there's one thing peculiar to everybody whom God ever saves. God's Holy Spirit does bring them to the place of trouble and dire distress and hymns them up under where, like in verse 6, they, then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. People won't do it in their prosperity. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. Verse 13, the same expression. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Verse 19, the same expression. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Distresses in verse 28, the same. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out. Of their distresses. Four different times here we have the Holy Spirit bringing a fellow by this route to this place of trouble where he'll cry unto the Lord. And then again he comes around this direction, but he lands whole center in the place of trouble, so deep in trouble that he'll do what he never will do otherwise. He'll look to the Lord. It's still true. There's life in a look, but it's likewise true that if a lost man has anything to say about it, he'll never be saved. If God Almighty, in his goodness and his mercy, through the merits of the blood of Jesus Christ, doesn't go looking for the sinner and crowd him and hem him and strip him and rob him, and bring him to the place of deep spiritual trouble and despair. He'll never cry unto the Lord. And he doesn't cry unto the Lord, he'll never get clean with him. It's a terrible commentary on the awful depravity of the human heart. But the sinner loves darkness rather than light. And he will bid himself like the birds from the early spring, you turn over the stone down our way, and the birds have been under that stone with the light all winter. And when the sun shines on those birds, you think they shout hallelujah, but they'll skeet at it to get back in the darkness. They love darkness rather than light. You cut out that piece of cloud. That's the reason it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Why, if a man is a, is, is a member of the human race and God ever saves him, why, of course, that man will say unto him, thanks unto the Lord for his mercy forever. Let, let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he has redeemed out of the hand of his enemies. Believe me, you'll praise God, and that's the missing love in present-day Christianity, real praise and worship of God. There'll be no worshiping of God until we recover the fact that salvation is of the Lord, and we're the products of his goodness, 
to the object of his mercy, you washed in the blood of his son, God, God, from start to finish, glory, hallelujah, give thanks unto the Lord. He hath redeemed us. How did he do it? The work of the Holy Spirit got people in trouble. People who would call the Lord. He whittled them down and hemmed them in, down to the place of spiritual agony. And then, and not until then, they cried unto the Lord. Nobody ever cried unto the Lord out of the agony of his soul. He didn't get on the direct line, brother. He'd find out there is a living God. He know what it means to touch God and be touched by God. I wonder if you believe it. You ain't got anybody around here you'd like to see saved? Huh? Brother George is telling us as a king brought us this morning about somebody inside of heaven out tonight who oh, wish the Lord saved him. Well, Brother George, start praying for the Lord to get him in trouble. Don't pray, oh Lord, bless sinners, Lord. They never will call on the Lord. Until they get in trouble. You believe that? A man will be satisfied with accepting a preacher's proposition, deciding to accept Jesus, join the church, being true to the distance of his father, doing this, that, and the other, and dying to the hell, and not know he's lost to the wakes up in hell. He'll be satisfied with those substitutes. Unless God in mercy strips him and makes him a spiritual pauper and brings him to the place of trouble, then he'll cry unto the Lord. Thank God. And then the Lord will save him and deliver him out of his distresses. I want to call your attention to this last thought. I'd like to dwell on that a little more. I don't know if it's clear or not. I hope it is. But I want to just spend the next two minutes, I think I have about that much time, in just reading the other thing that's here in this psalm. The Holy Spirit goes out on the basis of the work and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood's under everything, of course. Uh, and and the blood is shed because God is a God of mercy, not an altogether in the notion of showing mercy. And God, through his Spirit, hymns people up. Just look there in verse 4 and 5, how the Holy Spirit, just in one instance, how he goes about getting a man in spiritual distress so he'll call on the Lord. There's an old sinner, and the Holy Spirit goes to working on him, and the old fellow becomes a wanderer. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary weed. But they couldn't find any city to dwell in. Present company accepted, I think, nearly everybody I know. It gives the slightest evidence they have a vital union with the living Christ has been saved after they made their decision and after they joined the church. Most everybody I know. First time they did it, second time God did it. That's right. That's right. It's interesting how the Holy Spirit, oh, what a wonderful God we preach and serve and worship. He's determined to have a family. He's determined to have some people to sing praises to his grace throughout eternity. He's determined to have some people for himself. His inheritance in the saints. Christ saves people for himself. That he might, he, Saved us from our iniquities that he might bring unto himself, purify unto himself, unto himself, himself, himself. The peculiar people zealous under good works. And so here he is, he's trying to bring somebody to himself. He, he drives him over here in this corner, and the old fellow sees a place, and he ducks in that little alcove, and he has peace there for a little while, and the whole spirit keeps the law of God. Just out of there, as it's wandering around the circle and 
see the snow is fixed to light and finally looks in the fine little hollow here and the snow is up in the head. That gives him peace for a little while, but the Holy Ghost is still asking him and he'll drive him out of that like a slave driving him to whip him out of that little nest he's built. And he'll keep pushing him and driving him that old fellow around and he'll hide and he'll do everything that's the while. He's got no place to hide. He can find no city to dwell in. He's got nowhere to look but to God now. And the old sick keeps working on until he gets to hunger and thirsty. And he gets to hunger, thirsty, and to hunger, to, to thirsty, thirsty, that his soul thinks in him, he gives up. And he looks up and calls on God. And then God just delivers him. Isn't that wonderful? That's how God saves people. Now in verse 7, the thing I... We're going to see then, got off on. I want to read you the Holy Spirit description of what it means to be saved. Verse 7 After a man's been brought to trouble by the Lord, and the Lord delivered him out of his distresses and in all of it, the Lord takes him and he lifts him forth by the right way. Amen? This is salvation now. That they might go to a sacred habitation. Oh, Men will praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful work to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul. Is there any of that? Does it? Huh? Does it? For he satisfies the what? The long and soul, and fill the hungry soul with goodness. Huh? No wonder the psalmist says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Look down and <clears throat> look down and uh, I, 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 I think. My, Look down at uh, verse, uh, verse 29. I want to read that in okay. Three different distinctions of salvation here at each one of these divisions as the men are brought to cry unto the Lord. Verse 29. Boy, this is wonderful. He made it the star to come. So that the leaves there are the still. Then are they glad. Because they do cry. <clears throat> so he brings them under their desired faith. of the work to the children of men. Salvation takes us with the hand. He satisfies the longings of the soul. He feeds the hungry soul. He brings us to our desired haven. Amen. God bless you.